welcome to the Keenan Yoga Podcast, bringing you the stories of many people who in various ways are attempting to walk the path of yoga. Our intention is to inspire your own practice and commitment to yoga beyond the mat and in all areas of life. We consider this an offering, a service to the community and labour of love. If you feel inclined, any donations are appreciated, just visit our page and click the donate button at www.keenonyoga.co.uk forward slash podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Today's guests on the Keenan Yoga podcast are Richard Freeman and Mary Taylor. Richard Freeman began his study of yoga in 1968, beginning with one simple sitting posture of the Zen tradition. He spent nine years in Asia studying yoga, asana, Sufism, Sanskrit and Indian philosophical texts. In 1974, Richard began working with BKS Iyengar, later stumbling upon the late Sri, Sri K. Patabi Joyce when he taught a week's intensive in Colorado at the Feathered Pipe Ranch. He's well known for being one of the most advanced practitioners of the system to date, having completed the fifth series with Patabi Joyce, as well as studying personally with him all the pranayamas and a great deal of Sanskrit study. Richard is equally well known for his metaphorical, often humorous, teaching style. He was the founder with Mary, his wife, of the yoga workshop in Colorado, Boulder. It's produced some of the world's most well-respected teachers. He has also produced many well-regarded practice recordings and DVDs. More recently, he has turned his hand, along with his wife, to writing and has co-authored The Mirror of Yoga, The Art of Vinyasa, and most recently, The Fantastic When Love Comes to Light on the Bhagavad Gita, along with Mary. Mary Taylor began studying yoga in 1971, after she returned from France with a grand diploma from Julia Child's cooking school, L'Ecole des Trois Gourmandes. She found yoga whilst at university, but in 1988 found her primary teacher in Sri K. Patari Joyce. She continued studying and practicing yoga along with Buddhist teachings, as well as being passionate about food and diet. She has co-authored the books with Richard, as well as three cookbooks, as the co-author of What Are You Hungry For? Women, Food and Spirituality. So welcome to the Keenan Yoga Podcast, Richard and Mary. Um, can I just ask uh, you both how, um, how you started your journey with yoga? I think I've heard this from Richard before, but not from Mary. So maybe just a little brief overview and background. Oh, should I go first? Yeah, oh. go for it. <laughs> um, I became interested uh, when I first read, there was a, um, a thinker called Thoreau. Um, and uh, in the 18, I think he was in the 1840s, um, and he was part of the uh, Transcendentalist School along with Walt Whitman and Emerson, and they were dipping into the first uh, translations uh, that were available uh, of, you know, Indian thought. Mm. And uh, Thoreau was the most radical in that he just love nature he would go out and just go into trances uh you know at walden pond and yeah. he loved breezes and birds and nature and i was so inspired by that uh that uh i became interested in you know eastern thought uh particularly Indi indian thought at that time and then when i uh, made it to uh college um we were quite inspired by the late 60s and you know the uh, various aspects yeah that. various aspects <laughs> of the late 60s <laughs> and you you met you met at college did you both um no no, no we no. met long long after okay. yeah long after that and uh then um i i got into uh both buddhist practice and then uh i got uh what would I say? Not actually sidelined, but uh, I met the through Allen Ginsberg, the uh, Krishnas, Hare Krishna, the Hare Krishnas. But then uh, quickly that became a silly thing or a cult-like thing. Mm. Um, and as, as soon as they tried to, they 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 wanted to make money and they had things they wanted to distribute. So it was 
no longer um, <laughs> it was no longer interesting practice or open minded. So I went to India and uh, to pursue the roots of it, and that's it was very good. When you didn't, I remember you talking to you years ago at a workshop, and you you telling me you were in Persia before India, didn't? Weren't you in uh, Iran? Right. I was. I I lived in Iran for um, mm. four years, uh, mm. teaching yoga after I was in India, um, and then uh, so that was really good for my education because um, most of the students were was Muslim and. Uh, of course, there were Iranian uh, Jews and Baha'is, and but uh, it was very nice to have to translate culturally mm. uh, the ideas of yoga. And so, and then I, I also learned about politics and um, then revolutions. So, uh, <laughs> had to leave quickly. <laughs> uh, okay, so that was you were there when the Ayatollah Khomeini came into power then. Uh, yeah, right when they were doing their their big okay. coup. Yeah, I never actually asked. Did you train? What were you trained in? And did you do a reg? Were you always a teacher of yoga? Or did you? What, what I can't really imagine you doing anything, <laughs> anything before that, right? Yeah, I can't remember anything. Um, <laughs> I remember you. I remember an anecdote years ago when you were you were working, doing a f- farming or something, and and the. <laughs> Guy just said a few weeks, just a few yeah, weeks. Said, oh, what do you eat, or something like, or oh, maybe you, you must eat raw, or something. There's a funny anecdote you told, you know, and they were gonna, oh, you're a vegetarian, or something like that, you know. But yeah, I can't, <laughs> can't, can't, really, can't really imagine you on, you know, working on a farm. So you, you're always pretty much teaching. Oh, well, in once you are, <laughs> I, I became a monk in India, in which. You basically, you don't do a lot of teaching necessarily, but if you travel and you stay at someone's temple or their house, so you, you know, they, it's, and uh, they expect a little bit of teaching in return. Um, I don't think they, many people have high expectations, but (laughs) in order, um, and so I did that, you know, different places in India and Southeast Asia. Um, and so I, I went to, that was my first experience with Thailand and uh, then Malaysia. <laughs> but it was mostly mostly uh, Hindu communities or temples in those places. Uh, but of course, you know, the Buddhism was always, you know, part of my, in the back of my mind. Mm. Uh, having really my the first teacher I ever met was in Chicago Zen Center uh, in the '60s, and he was quite, quite adept, quite profound, mm. and so I was always kind of had that in the background that uh, yeah. mm. this is, and I still have that in the background um, that <laughs> there's this intimate uh, similarity and connection, even though the language gets flipped and. Um, between various Buddhist schools and then various yoga schools that they've borrowed from each other happily and learned from each other. And mm. and so if you can uh, take the meanings of their words and kind of flip them over, you'll say, oh, they're really almost identical in what they're doing. <laughs> and okay. they, both, they both profit from each other. It's just like two people, you know, who are. Mm-mm. I was going to. I definitely want to kind of talk marginally more about that because I know that you, you know, you, you're living in an area which is pretty big for Buddhism, right? I mean, well, you had Chogyam Trungpa, I think, set up the Shambhala school there. He was a yeah. kind of, well, kind of a you know, kind of hero of mine, you know, well, marginally, you know, at least a legendary <laughs> figure, let's say, a questionable. Legendary. figure. Um, <laughs> but, and I, I was a bit also interested in Tibetan Buddhism. I, I'm. I, I um, Jimmy Rinpoche and Akon Rinpoche uh, were oh. you know, kind of uh, friends of uh, Chogam Chumpa, so yeah, you so I have him from yeah, and then yeah. Um, anyways, before we diverge, um, so let, we have a lot to get through. Mary, can you just briefly? Yeah, a very mine is much more yeah. you know sort of plebeian. Um, I was at university and um, was studying psychology, focusing on Gestalt work. 
and was have the a type A personality, which is attracted to Ashtanga yoga and other things, and um, you know was quite stressed. And my dear friend said, you know, try some yoga. I tried it, and it really, really helped. But it, I I kind of laugh about it now because as much as anything, it made me more efficient so I could do more. So it wasn't really some grandiose idea about philosophy or anything like that, but it was like, <laughs> hey, I'm stressed out and now I can do even more. And, right. um, and then over the years, I just kept coming back to it. And then eventually after, you know, lots and lots of different things and I was in France because I was studying cooking at that point um, after university. And um, then, you know, after many, many years, I ended up in Boulder, where Richard is, and this is where we met and um, met through yoga and and actually met outside of yoga doing as I was sort of coordinating some uh, programs for inter uh, sort of inter so I, I was I was doing programs for a health food store right. on how do we get health in different manners from different things from medical to yoga to cooking etc and that's where we ended up actually meeting um Did you train at the cordon bleu cook yeah. i trained briefly right. at the cordon right. bleu but then i was Love i did the most helpful um <laughs> take yeah. a bit of butter and then yeah and i but i did my three. main training my main training was with uh julia child and simone back at their school and that was i got their grand di- diploma and then did apprenticeships in restaurants um and a pastry shop in paris mm-hmm. however i've I've never liked meat, even as a kid. And so it was this weird thing that over (laughs) the, after I got through with that, I started morphing and, and applying those techniques to vegetarian cooking. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of where I've gone with that part Mm -hmm. of my, my idea of what is nice in life. (laughs) <laughs> it's nice for me too because <laughs> someone has to eat what she prepares you know <laughs> that's incredible i want to go back a little bit about diet later um yeah can you i mean everyone always um, wants this i almost feel like i'm wasting um, time here but um you know wait um can you just briefly give our introduction to uh your experience with ashtanga yoga um and you know uh, your your time in, say something about your time in Mysore and, and do, do you meet before Mysore and Mary? Were you there with Richard? Yeah. I, I don't know that part yeah. of it. But... We met before. Right. Yeah. Okay. And Richard met uh, Patabi Joyce in um, the United States at a place called Feathered Pipe Ranch when he was, Patabi Joyce was here. With, uh, with Ama. And, right. Uh, it was a small, it's a little retreat center off in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, Quite nice. It was a, a group of maybe 20 people. Yeah. And uh, we were all, you know, there for just over a week, uh, which was kind of nice uh, because I got to uh, talk to him a lot. Yeah. And, uh, and he was quite excited that there was someone who, you know, knew a little bit of Sanskrit and 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 I studied quite a bit of Iyengar yoga at and, that point, as well as you know, uh, other. And other so sports. when I I had been studying with Richard, and he he'd mainly done kind of Iyengar type classes before that, and so the whole community in Boulder, you know, was used to him doing these kind of you know Iyengar esque classes and there was a Friday night class that was so relaxing and it was good for me because that was the one time I would relax and uh, then he went off and did this and came back and did this workshop on Ashtanga and we're all looking at one another going what on earth is this stuff and that's (laughs) long story (laughs) short soon after uh, we went to India and um that was my first trip to India and Richard returning. And that was when we went to Mysore. Yeah. Well, they were there for yeah. six months? Yeah, it was more than, yeah, just over six oh, months. Yeah, we, were, we were lucky because for at least a month, we were the only students. Yeah. Um, 
And I entered <laughs> yoga as incredibly stiff, incredibly the beginner. Yeah. And so the first day I was with Patabi Joyce, you know, after class, because he stopped me like at triangle pose or something, literally. And um, he he just came up to me and he said, but why is it so stiff? You know, and I'm like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, then he said, oh, very strong mind. And I thought, well, that's cool. I got that's a good, a strong mind. I <laughs> realized later that wasn't so good. Uh, and And so in that period or that month long period where we were the only two, it's like, are you going to adjust Richard or are you going to adjust this person who can't do anything? So I got a lot of assists that were relatively intense, but the yoga had, at that point, it felt like it really took root. It really transformed mm -hmm. body, soul, mind uh, yeah. in a way that psychology and working with Gestalt work had had teased around, but my mind had always <clears throat> been able to sort of avoid the difficult parts, <clears throat> whereas in yoga, you can't. <laughs> so that was very helpful to me. When was yeah. that? I mean, uh, the 80s, was it? Yeah, 80. That was early 88. Right. Late okay. 87, late 87, early 88, I think. And still at that point, there were so few people sometimes. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Right. Well, during you, the hot season. Yeah, when April, when March and April came. Okay. <laughs> no one else was going to be there. Well, and it was just, you know, at the peak, it was 12 people. Yeah, yeah, right. Yes. That, was, that was crowded. Yeah, that, that was, was crowded. Was... Well, did you, um, did you, how did you learn this? I mean, you, Richard, you've done the uh, Iyengar before. But, I mean, how was your progress in the series? Obviously, you were known to, you know, um be a very adept you know at the the ashtanga series is did you go through quickly or i mean how was your feeling of the tradition well, and you know at that point well, in that one week we spent at the feathered pipe ranch hmm. in montana i learned most of first second and third series <laughs> um <laughs> what were you doing when you went to mysore and what was left to do oh well <laughs> Third, fourth, fifth series, and then uh, and then learning to break them apart into different bizarre combinations. It's so right, so you gave that he gave you different combinations. After oh yeah, the so little pieces of one and the pieces of the other, because they're they're really intended to be tools rather mm. than you know mm. it's like learning a musical scale. Okay, now you know the musical scales. Why don't you play some music? Okay get get down to the actual task at hand um and, hey, and people forget that definitely um more than part of my intention for the podcast um in the first place you know to try and uh, you know kind of have some more space around this increasingly dogmatic presentation of it right and when you were i mean sequences quite traditionally roughly as they are now i assume roughly mm -hmm. speaking in a similar manner that they are now the fourth series and the fifth series or and and then after that what kind of uh, breakdown did he give oh well he would have you do first he split them into halves you would do one day half of primary half of intermediate half of third and then all of fourth <laughs> uh, and this is all four hours worth of practice you know which is gets to you yeah. you're a little bit hungry afterwards <laughs> <laughs> and then the next day the second half of the primary and then the other half of the second which you didn't do and the other half of the third and then all the fourth and and then he would mix it up because he wanted the you know the variety you'd oh. never do the same thing day after day right but you would uh always you know come back and review this and you know have new insight into that um, and even for me, you know, by the end of our time there, I had worked my way through um, intermediate series. Mm -hmm. um, and he always had everyone, uh, ro you know, rotate uh, what you were practicing. So one day primary, sick, and then the next day intermediate, and then primary right. and intermediate. Right. And I've continued. Mm -hmm. That's how we have continued. And I have definitely continued forever because it feels like 
then as you add more things on, you're not, you know, you're not grasping so much at, at the goal of the next mm-hmm. posture, but you also are um, really f- going deeply into the things that you think, oh, I, I know how to do that one. When in fact, day after day, it's so mm-hmm. different as we all know. Mm. And it gives you the opportunity to really go deeply and and in a more contemplative manner. Yeah. So yeah, what what I learned with uh, Patabi Joyce was that he was really interested in uh, the Sri Vidya Tantra and the fact that the idea of the vinyasa practice is a continuous cultivation of mudra and bandha with each breath and so um and that's the whole thing it doesn't as the flexibility is a temporary uh byproduct <laughs> a little more temporary than we would like you know um and that what's interesting is the um the palate the tongue the sushumna nadi the joining of the prana and the apana throughout the body and you know getting those balanced uh continuously um and that's what he was really interested in but i'm not sure he was um good at communicating that to a lot of people because he was very orthodox he considered himself extremely non-orthodox because he would he would speak to foreigners you know (laughs) Uh, which is considered, you know, normally he should, you would take a bath after you, <laughs> you know, know someone like that. You go, Ugh, I just saw this. Uh, untouchable. Did he go further? I mean, when you um, when you talk about the the you know the Vidya Tantra and the Bandha and the soft palates, I mean, was he interested in in further careers, in Kachari Mudra and this kind of thing? Did he did he take oh, it yeah. further? So right. So did mm. did he give you instruction on that? Oh yeah, right. Yeah, joining Prana and Apana in the navel was his fascination. And the pranayama and, was, you know, the big part of that, too. Mm. Yeah. That and was, you, so we would practice one-on-one. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he, was a, he was a character, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, obviously you came home and you taught the sequence and you taught it in the manner you've been instructed and did you always break it up? So you did one day, one thing and the other day, the other thing. And I mean, I suppose in a roundabout way, like, especially now in, in, in modern times with the way it's become and then, you know, what does tradition mean to you in the sequence of Ashtanga yoga and in, in your teaching and how do you convey that? If it's not, if it's not literally parampara of the series or parampara of the lineage, you know, What's the benefit of tradition and what has it come to mean to you now? And did it mean something different to you then? Or did you always well, have to take on it? It changes day by day what it means. <laughs> but uh, the, the actual tradition is, um, you know, his, his fascination and concern with that which really turned him on, literally, um, <laughs> which I think he felt... You know, with uh, because of his, you, you know, upbringing culturally, he didn't see most students as being interested in it. And so, and so he would just say, Oh, well, for now, we'll just do this. And, uh, you know, I can make some good money <laughs> from these people. <laughs> but uh, he wanted to do more with it. And then he didn't because he felt the reception wasn't there or. In that, you know, yeah, the interest wasn't there because because the tradition is if they don't ask, you don't tell. Okay, right. And so, but people don't even know what to ask, and they don't have the um the background to you know, know what the to background ask. to know. And he, we were there um, at one point where he began doing you know, conferences where he had not been doing them before, and so on Saturday there would be a conference. And it would be a small group of us. And he would come in and sit down and then start speaking. And he was talking about a text of some sort every time. Um, And Richard, who happened to be one of the people who was there who had read most of the texts, would 
would catch and understand what he was talking about because he would have mentioned the name of the text and he would mention certain words in Sanskrit that Richard would know. But a lot of his language skills for English speakers were just non-existent. And so many of us would sit there and you'd catch a phrase here and there, but you really, you know, you could, I, my experience with it was to really just go with his enthusiasm and go with Mm. the feel of what he was trying to present. And then I'd hear a phrase and it would blow my mind. Um, But a lot of the people who were in the room wanted to really have his, you know, wanted them to speak the same language and would almost talk to him like he had some defectiveness, like a, you might, you know, with a child really because loudly with, because he wasn't understanding. His English was so broken and not very good. And you, you never knew exactly what he was talking <laughs> about because <laughs> he would, you know, he would get, you know, the certain cases wrong and the verb, <laughs> verb form would be wrong and you weren't sure. But but what then and so he would he would do this beautiful. <laughs> he way. gave it a good go though. I mean, he definitely spoke in a continuous stream. When, you know, oh, for sure. For the good and for the bad, but it was a continuous yeah, yeah. stream of yeah. you know, like it was yeah. yeah. And he was loving it. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then in these lectures, he would do this beautiful speech, yeah. and then he'd say any doubts or any questions. And there would be a pause, and then someone would raise their hand and say, "Well, where does your foot go?" And um, trikonasana or something right. like that. And then you just yeah. see her face mm-hmm. melt because mm-hmm. he wanted people to, to grab hold of something right. beyond that. And, I, and, mm-hmm. and in our perspective, that was one of the reasons that, you know, in the end, he, he started making it more just about, well, right. put your foot here, do this mm-hmm. breath there. But then also when we uh, had our studio, one of the things we recognized was that if you, use the Ashtanga system as the foundation, which we did, but we did it from kind of a broad perspective where we would mm-hmm. allow and, uh, you know, and encourage variations on certain things, etc. that the tendency for many people is to go off on these wild tangents where they avoid what is, you know, really the important aspect of whatever this posture might be bringing up for them mm-hmm. or the sequence. And so on one level, by, you know, codifying the series, by making it more rigid and more strict, you have a certain amount of um, of uh, sort of the benefit of having something that you must do. And the teacher has a little more control Mm -hmm. over a, a massive crowd and that is now there. And so on one level, as a student, if you you know, give in to your desires to just, well, today I don't really feel like balancing yeah. poses. I'll just do a bunch of back bends. Then that's really where you go off the rails. Yeah, people usually don't benefit from that because they're just following their... Their sense fields. Yeah. Mm. And so within any religious or meditative practice, it's almost like you have a pre-agreed upon sacred pattern which could be, um, and and if you go into it, uh, you know, without the intention of trying to benefit from it, you know, you're doing it as an offering to others rather than a way of achieving uh, fame and money or power or something. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the, of course, the most important thing. <laughs> then you're not going to grasp at it in a way that it hurts you or hurts others. Um, but the, the, it's just like with certain religious songs or mantras. Uh, you don't say, well, let me just make up my own mantra today. Um, that usually doesn't work because it's not something that's, uh, you know, you've, it's, it's, it hasn't been empowered even in your own mind. Mm. Um, but what happens is then, okay, so we have a, a sequence which most people can do like say a sun salutation or most younger people. Okay. Mm-hmm. At a certain point, it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, and, but then, uh, you know, if you grasp too tightly at it or, you know, it might not be appropriate all the time. And so if it's done as a, as an offering, uh, as part of a, a deeper internal sacrifice in order to enter 
you know, these higher states of samadhi to open the central channel, um, then it'll be done appropriately. Um, rather than, oh, if you do 108 sun salutations, mm. we're going to give you, you know, a thousand points, um, which you can cash in later in when you in Indra Loka. And so that grasping at the points makes you a, a religious fanatic rather than a mystic, rather than someone who's has a sense of humor and compassion. And so I think in the, you know, sometimes we, we err in the, the side of uh, fanaticism, even though it's a set rich, it, it's just like if there are certain temples you enter, you know, which are holy spots, and it's, you, you do certain little customs, so as not to upset others. And, uh, and so our practice is like that. It's, um, and in fact, every tradition does that, even, even if they tell you, oh, just do what is going to work. Like if you go to an Iyengar class, and I, I knew Mr. Iyengar quite well, uh, you're, you're going to still start in very similar ways and do very right. similar postures. It's almost like, was there any difference between that class? And, and so there was also these sequences, but they weren't written in gold. They were, but they were still, you know, followed and people would then, Oh, now I can relax. How do you engender or, or the, the approach for the student so it's not just literally about sequential pro progression because that's i think the danger isn't it? you've got these sequences and it, it, it's, it's just so easy to follow a tunnel of progress with them um and also you know in teaching them you can easily just become a glorified policeman like oh you ought to be doing this why did you skip why did you skip that oh your foot should be there yeah right i mean it's boring and it's tedious and it really it, you know it can easily trap one's mind into going to the you know to take the whole thing the tool and use it for the very opposite direction you know that we're, we're trying to do how any words of advice on how to avoid falling into this cul-de-sac um because, I mean, I think I had it as well. I mean, you know, I went to, I started off yoga with some great ideas, similar to you probably, Richard, with, it wasn't Thoreau, but it was probably similar kind of things. Um, you know, then I go to Mysore and then kind of got sidetracked with many years with just gymnastics, because I was quite good at the gymnastics, you know. And, um, you know, it's so easy to get sucked in to, uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, can you I think I think everyone has to cross that line a few times. Right, and, right. Which all of a sudden they discover that which they, you know, have been uh, afraid of, you know, that you are all of a sudden a, a religious fundamentalist and willing to, you know, go to war, <laughs> you know, to defend your sequence okay. <laughs> or your mantra <laughs> and, or your prophet or whatever. Yeah, um, and in terms of teaching, I think it is just vital that we continue to practice in in a non-dogmatic way um, and as we age we you know you run into things either and it happens when you're young if you get sick or yeah. injured or whatever but as you age it will happen even if you've Absolutely. lucked out and not had anything happen yeah. and and as your own practice evolves and as you consistently uh, go deeply into it then you start to be able to see students more clearly. And, and then you have, you know, cultivated this uh, ability within yourself to listen and to really see the student and to listen to what their uh, perspectives are, what their needs are, so that you might find a student who is always wanting attention and is always needing you to talk to them. And, then, and they might be the student who you don't do that with, mm. whereas there's someone who, 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 you know, just says, no, I'm fine. And they might be someone, maybe you don't talk to them, but you, you know, encourage them in certain ways. And, and so it becomes a very two way street. And you think of the student much more as uh, they, you are their servant rather than you are you know, sort of their master. Yeah. And, and that, <laughs> that really, in terms of being a teacher, mm -hmm. that feels good because mm -hmm. you think, wow, what do they need and mm -hmm. what will benefit them? And 
here's this beautiful structure, the Ashtanga system, and how does it work for them and their body? And so sometimes we might have a student who had, you know, blown out a hamstring attachment or something and was just working on primary series. And we would start introducing some of the beginning part of intermediate series because those really start to train the legs and the hamstring, mm. et cetera. And, but then you don't do that with everyone necessarily. So it's, it's like, it becomes a very, um, you know, it, you have to wake up and walk in and see what the day offers. Mm. So it's, it's, it's individualized. It's, uh, for each student at a certain point. Um, but keeping them also, giving them, you know, really trying to teach them a good attitude <laughs> mm -hmm. so that they uh, are happier. Um, and then if they're, if they're material for, you know, the circus, um, <laughs> that's wonderful too, you know. I mean, we've, we've had students who are part of Cirque du Soleil, which is, and, yeah. and it's just so educational to watch the body geometry, uh, and that's fine. But <laughs> yeah, Richard uh, often will say, you know, that blessed are the stiff because they are the ones who, you know, really experience the yoga. Um, which, as a stiff person, I you know took a little bit offense at at the beginning because it was like, it was no, a, I don't feel very blessed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's true yeah. when you are stiff, you you know, walk in the room and lift your arms over your head and you have some major sensations. Yeah. And, and, and that's what it's about is, is waking up to that. It takes the, you know, it takes the possibility of just kind of getting involved in literal accomplishment, you know, and kind of, you know, makes it a bit more difficult. Right. So you yeah. sucked into that so much. Um, and you got, you were both taught, you know, I mean, Richard, I know that you did the Sanskrit with Batavi Joyce, the, the Pranayama. I think, you know, Mary, you, you definitely did the Pranayama, right? I'm not sure. Were you into the I Sanskrit? Did the, I did not do the Pranayama with him yeah. except okay. public Pranayama. Right, right. And then I did, um, yeah, so I just did asana with him. Do, I mean, this is maybe a silly question, but do you, I mean, you taught the um, pranayamas and the sanskrit and the philosophy along with the asana i think you know to degrees do practitioners need to do those aspects those other aspects to make it effective yoga so mm. long-winded version of a question of basically is asana enough <laughs> oh. because sangha yoga has become well, yeah it's supposed to have eight limbs rather than one yes yeah <laughs> that, so we try to start them with being ahimsa, just being nice, you know. Yeah. Just, being, <laughs> but uh, so formal pranayama might be too much for some people. But you know, I I try to develop ways that where people get a a, a good taste for what pranayama is, mm -hmm. which they just see the the what what a delight it is to inhale. <laughs> <laughs> simple things and you know and even to exhale and just to feel the patterns and then to look at it as so pranayama is actually a, it's a epicurean delight you know you you become ah oh, you know if you do it right it's just like it's a matter of good taste uh it, it, literally it releases the palate yeah uh and brings nectar into the body. And you don't have to be capable of long retention to at least get an initial feeling for it. Um, What's the point of the long retentions? Because, I mean, I know... Oh, it helps you concentrate. If it, oh. As long as, you know, the concentration is, is good, there's a balance. It's not like you're trying to hold it, but it's just a natural... You know, it's just, it's an aesthetic experience. It's like, ah, and so there's a pause and that pause might go on for, you know, uh, even a few minutes, but it, it's not a contest. Um, and occasionally, you know, people who are quite physically fit and who are professional divers, uh, mm -hmm. they can train themselves, you know. Um, but for most of us, we just have to see that the, 
pranayama is pranayama is the word. So the prana is being released from the bonds or the yamas, the restrictions, and so it's allowed to like shine out like sun. Mm. Um, so that's pranayama, and people can get a taste of that. Uh, and of course, the asana really helps. If you just have someone sit down and then they do bastrika and get a little bit dizzy or something, they uh, that's that's rather manipulative on the, the part of the teacher. Um, so for some people, just like uh, simple simple asana and then really simple pranayama, they go, "Oh, this is nice stuff." And mm. it's a it's a process so it builds and mm. you become interested in some of the other aspects you know as we all know it's you know you practice for consistently over a long period of time and you know so it happens when it's supposed to happen and one of the things we encourage that many practitioners not only ashtangis um, have difficulty with is that we very much encourage finishing postures, especially right. if you have a rigorous practice, mm -hmm. because then you reset, then you um, comb out the nervous system and assimilate, and then you're nicer rather than grasping and thinking, yeah, I did it. I did third series and I'm cool. And, and it, it, it uh, <laughs> comes together that way. So to really focus on the finishing and taking your time in those is essential. And that is a way in a, in a, in a sense of tricking people into the meditative mind right. um, because mm -hmm. the mind is there just, you know, following the breath and the breath is always there. The, the breath is inviting the mind to calm down all day, all night. And if we just listen to it occasionally, things start to, to morph. And it, it's really freedom in the practice rather than a sense of rigidity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the hard part for many of us is the vairagyam. <laughs> we can do the abhyasa and the vinyasa, you know, we get it, oh, t -t 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 -t. but we can't like <laughs> give it away. And you offer uh, it. It's not just putting scary. it down. It's, yeah. it's as an offer. Yeah, it's not a rejection, but it's like, uh, exposing the whole thing in all of its depth, you know, even psychologically or and, and just like letting it become so, exposed to a pure, pure awareness. And that's scary stuff to let it all go. It's kind of like the moment of death, but it's, that's it. <laughs> Not smoothly really segued into it, but uh, you've recently you've written a, a, a book recently, uh, When Love Comes to Light. Um, it's, it's on the back of a Gita. Um, can you talk maybe a bit about that idea of devoting um, and giving away and sacrifice that is the crux of the, well, the Gita is devotion and action or sacrifice and action. I you know, mm -hmm. don't want to step on your toes there, but <laughs> how does, <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> how does you know, can you say something about that, the, the importance of the Bhagavad Gita um, in regards to yoga or, you know, kind of inspire some, why would someone want to read the Bhagavad Gita? Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the Bhagavad Gita places yoga in, uh, it explains yoga beautifully. Um, and it cuts through sectarian confusion uh, because it, it cuts through the language uh, to get to really what counts, uh, which is hard to express, but some has something to do with love. Um, <laughs> and so, but the importance is, you know, that people have mistaken historically yoga um, with non-action. You just don't do anything mm. you know, you, and you avoid anything where you have to do, you know, it's, and so, uh, and people misunderstand, you know, the, uh, say, Sankhya, which is, you know, this ancient philosophical school. They think, well, well, Sankhya just means, you know, that it's all, it's all Prakriti and, you know, Prakriti is useless anyway, just get rid of it. Um, and so the, it's maintaining that there's, wherever there's manifestation, there's action constantly. 
So even if you think you're not acting, uh, you're you're still breathing. <laughs> you're you're still like you know if a, going to the bathroom probably occasionally, even if you're a great yogi, um, eating occasionally, um, and and so the inevitability of action, and then the qualities of action that if you in real life and immediate circumstances, if you don't act, that will have a, an effect. Or, or if you do act, that will have an effect. And mm. so people get very confused, and particularly when they get into ethical dilemmas. Should I do something about this problem or should I leave it alone? Mm. And so Arjuna is in that crisis of how should I act? And the... Gita is saying, yes, act. You know, you, since you're going to act, the body and the mind are going to act anyway. Mm. Notice that the body and the mind are not actually you, Arjuna, but they're going to act anyway. And so yoga is actually the art of action or the skill of action. And so someone who makes their action done as sacrifice becomes the true yogi. In other words, and sacrifice is, is just one of those words that hits you differently than act. Yeah. Like a sacrifice. You go, uh oh. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> sacrifice, me. you know, holds a sort of background meaning of context. And so you take action in context mm -hmm. of others. And and one of the underlying themes of the Gita also is this idea of the fact that everything in life is made up of these wave patterns of change, etc. But patterns of uh, ebb and flow and that everything is interconnected everything is interpenetrating and therefore it is of great importance that we wake up and actually you know come to our senses which mm -hmm. arjuna does in the very very beginning he comes into his physical senses by blowing the conch shell and it you know gets him grounded to earth as a Big, big exhale plus he's like his head is spinning from the vibratory qualities and he wakes up to what's going on right here right now and that's the invitation of the Gita and mm. that's why it's so interesting to me um, as to it being a guidebook for not only learning about Indian philosophy but you know our daily lives and what do we do when we ourselves run into conflicts or difficulties or crises mm -hmm. and and you know the the short answer is you you we have inherent qualities of tenderness and love and compassion that come mm -hmm. with they're the hardware of being human mm -hmm. and if we can un you know un veil them and and tap into them then we don't mm -hmm. have to think our way through things we can interface and we can act in a way that is very natural and of benefit to the whole rather than to strictly ourselves hmm. yeah so arjuna is encouraged to act um but then to act without selfish motivation egotistical motivation because that's and then when you act, you get feedback. <laughs> but because you're not attached to, you're not doing it out of an ego, you know, from an egotistical yeah. standpoint, yeah. you listen to the feedback and you make corrections. It's like when you're shooting an arrow, uh, you, you take a shot and then you can fine tune. I like the bit of the conch shell and, and the, the idea of the conch shell being a kind of visceral waking up. I, I, there's a couple of, I like, use waking up a lot and visceral in, in conjunction with each other so you've got this idea of using the senses and the you know and, and you would consider that you using the yoga gives you this sensory kind of um stimulation like blowing the conch shell to yeah. consider to, to to come into this state of waking up but and you mentioned it a lot um yeah i would just like to hear from the horse's mouth as it were what what you feel is waking up <laughs> oh waking up to yeah. Yeah, what is called pratyaksha or pratyaksha, which is that which is right before your eyes. Right. Which is referring to the immediate experience, which are the direct sensations, are called prana, which is this vibrant 
uh, immediate sense perception before the mind categorizes it or labels it and then creates, starts to create a story, thereby ignoring it. And so we occasionally, uh, everyone has these moments where they actually pay attention just to pure sensation, uh, but it doesn't last because we're trained some scars to label things and then to create stories, thereby ignoring the direct experience of what's this. Um, and so Krishna keeps pointing out, you know, this is this is me, that which is, you know, that's me, not somebody on a big pedestal somewhere, mm. you know, on part of some, you know, dharma or causal chain in your mind but that which is right in front of your eyes or in front of your ears, if you like. Or... And so waking up really is, is this idea that uh, you have become so fascinated with whatever is arising before you that your awareness of yourself sort of fades and disappears and um, that, that you are completely absorbed in what is right before you to the point that you have no idea what is going to pop up next. And you are extraordinarily comfortable um, feeling uh, the sense of not knowing what is going to happen next. And so that's really what waking up is, is that you are there and and not like you're, you've got a plan. It's just you're you're there and you are curious and you're asking questions and you are totally engaged. Mm. And then the plans come, you know, if they're needed. Yeah. Then you, you may mm. need to act or you may need to not act, but, but it becomes clear and you're not doing the action as it's, you know, stated in the Gita, you're not taking action uh, because you want the fruits of the action. You're taking action because that's what needs to happen for mm. the, the greater good. Yeah. And is that what um is that what Krishna is saying when he's saying kind of I mean people get uncomfortable when you they hear these ideas of sacrifice and devotion, you know, when Krishna says, devote to me, you know, right. um, you know, <laughs> and it's yeah. like, well, no, I'd rather not, you know. I've had it, I've <laughs> no, really. We've been down that path before. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> well, um, is that so we, if we rephrase that, maybe it's more like devote, devote to our knowing. Or, you know, yeah. devote yeah. to present. Devote to that which is the true self. So what I've noticed in the Gita is that Krishna keeps trying to reveal himself as, you know, all of these immediate the things. The simplest. The, the things that he, this is actually Krishna. Yeah. Not, and your ideas about Krishna, they are also, it is all divine prakriti. But... So he keeps coming off of the, the different pedestals that he's placed upon into, hey, you know, I am, I am this beloved in the heart of all beings. Um, and, and we d differentiate and point out the difference between um, sort of taking refuge mm. in a, another and um Surrender. surrendering <laughs> to another and and those that's a really important differentiation to understand because you know when you say oh i'm going to surrender to this on one level you you know that's a good intention but it sets it has the potential to set up a sort of power structure yeah. Yeah. where one person is sort of being controlled by the other but in the in a place of refuge it is a place where both parties both sides are vulnerable and are open and are sharing and truthful mm -hmm. and so and they have the same goal which is not connected to one of them as being better or worse but the goal is or the aim or the aspiration is one of connection and one of uh you know, in this case, one of love. And so there's a huge difference in using, in how we use words. And if you say surrender, it does mm. mean something very, very different from taking refuge. 
Yeah, and it can also, I mean, when you, the Gita and surrender and duty, it can all almost get very easily deterministic quickly, you know? Like, Absolutely. you know, you can, you start before yoga, you start to kind of believe you can control your world and then you get into yoga and you kind of get rather kind of, you know, um, disappointed and you, you start to assume that you can't do anything, that you're conditioned with your karma and you're stuck. I mean, how... How can yeah. you use, how can you use the and you mentioned this in the Gita? Can you kind of explain the difference between you know just a fatalistic idea um, and and actually doing your duty in a way that's still animate or you know yeah the idea that karma is actually the creative art and particularly you know even little tiny things that you do have residue or an effect. And so once you start to see that and you experience it in particularly in meditation practice, because then you're watching, you know, moment by moment, little subtleties of mind, of sensation. Um, and you, you start to see the, you know, the, the, the linkings between these different levels and you see, oh, I could actually, this is a creative principle. And it's actually the principle that's used to, makes time and space is uh, and so the Gita presents karma as this divine function uh, and it's it's the divine function of prakriti or creative energy and uh, the many times in the Gita they call it daivi or divine because mm -hmm. it's often in different schools saying oh it's just that you know it's it's just the gunas on the gunas it's just prakriti yeah. Yeah. And uh, but if you say it's divine, then you go, oh, <laughs> maybe I better. Uh, and and it's the principle that uh, you know the whole universe is created from uh, is that divine. Yeah, and I get it. So at least you can, um, you know, you might not be able to change, you know, world politics quickly. Um, <laughs> it's you know, it's a, it's a quite an extensive but you can you know with this creative principle you can uh serve other beings um and then so in the gita krishna really takes on the role of a bodhisattva or a being who says i'm going to keep coming back even though i don't need to come back i'm going to come back until everybody uh, is happy mm -hmm. and, and he's got the time you know and as it turns out all all, of us do. Yeah, we yeah. all have the time. Yeah, and so it's the Gita is a is a very brilliant presentation of the that beautiful part of Mahayana Buddhism where uh, you're you're willing to just keep coming back and to you know use all of these the principle of embodiment in the service of others, uh, even though you're you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it. And so it's the joy of service. And that's what Krishna has. And then he says, and anyone else who does that, you know, they're so dear to me, I can't even express it. And uh, do you feel like, I mean, I know that you're kind of well known for Buddhist practices. Um, is there any discrepancy between the Buddhist practices and the view of yoga? I mean, I assume that you, you know, you both continue a meditation practice, which is more Buddhist, right? I mean, I was just coming to mind that the idea in the in the Gita is also to go into a state where you're uh, free of suffering and you don't return. You know, so it, in, in a you know, in a way, it's it's a, you know, it's, it seems like a selfish endeavor. You use these tools to escape suffering, and you go into the realm with Krishna, and you know, and you're out of there. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're you're out of there, but you're here. Um, Do you is there any discrepancy? I mean, students have also asked me, um, you know, can I do Buddhism, you know, practice and practice yoga? Is You know, this is a confusion that I'd like your opinions on. Yeah, they're not identical, but right. they are intimately related. And a, a big focus of our teaching over the last 10 years or so, and even before that, has been to look at the interfacing mm -hmm. of these two traditions that come from the same root. And, um, you know, and to stay out of the trap of thinking, oh, it's all one, but yeah. to look at, well, what, you know, how do we um, 
compare and contrast them and learn from them and take the practices that uh, enrich both of them um, so that, that both traditions in the way we are able to work with them can evolve. And so our work a lot of times um, is with Buddhist teachers mm. um, and who are also interested in looking at, well, what is yoga? Mm. How does that relate to Buddhism? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for instance, I work with Joan Halifax, who is a Zen teacher and she you know, 20 years ago, I started working with this program called Being With Dying. And she said, you know, we've got to have this embodiment piece as part of it. And she and I have kind of danced around that for years. And it's only literally in the last maybe four or five years that we've really seen how they enmesh with each other in the context of this particular training. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, it's happened because we've, asked each other questions and we've said, well, this is what I do and this is what this tradition offers. And then, you know, well, this is what this tradition offers. Oh, they're different. Oh, they're the same. And what are the, um, what are they actually getting at deeply? Mm -hmm. And when you look deeply, like at the Gita, um, Krishna is really the Bodhisattva. Um, and, and, for us, that's been our take on it, which yeah. people yeah. might reject. Mm. And that's that's good because then we have a conversation about it. It's a dialogue. And you know, it's like the Bible, isn't it? You can I think you can see all things in there. That definitely is a viewpoint. I also suggest there's another possible take on it where Christian is just saying, you know, you want to escape this altogether, right? Like absolutely. You know, like, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but then by that time he's He's redefined what this is. And so someone who is, uh, has all beings in their heart, they experience such pleasure and awe that they don't need the conceptual liber They are liberated, even though they are enmeshed in this divine prakriti, which is all these things happening. It doesn't bother them. So they're liberated. Um, and the conception of liberation is, you know, oh, that I'm going to get away with it. And you imagine some space where you know, you're flying out in outer space and there's the universe, a little ball in the distance. Um, mm. That's just our own minds. And that would be considered part of the Prakriti itself. And the um, literalism happens in uh, Buddhist studies also. Oh. And so it's interesting to say, oh, that's the literalism that's entering in. That's so that's one of the wave patterns mm. um, that's making us see it in that from that perspective. Let's mm. look again. Let's mm. look more deeply. Yeah. So, so Vedanta and Sankhya, they're saying, oh, there's a self. And well, Buddhism says, oh, there's no self. Yeah. And uh, that's and both are extremely what if they say, well, what do you mean by self? And so the, the Upanishads do that. Oh, do you know, who are you? And then if you start looking, you can't find anything. And if you keep looking, you still get anything you find that isn't the self because it's, <laughs> you know, it's a constructed thing. And the Buddhists would totally agree. Um, and so, and it's a, it's a, it's, a funny thing in language where we start talking metaphysically and you run into this paradoxes very quickly. And, uh, and, that, and that's Buddhism in the end, the Vedanta, they, they delight in the paradox. At least some of them do. But the ones who are still into the, uh, you know, the politics of it, they, they, the paradox gives them reasons for, for fighting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So essentially, yeah. there's no difference between the idea of the yoga where you're kind of trying to, you know, kind of focus one pointedly towards a to lift the self up by the self. Right. Like uh, mm -hmm. and, and then Buddhism, where there's, you know, it's like a flick book. There's no essential self there at all. Right? I always think of it in that way. Right. Like yeah. they're the same yeah, thing. Exactly. They're really yeah. the same thing. Right. Um, but it you got to really look at it. And inquire to see if the, if they're really the same thing. 
Mm. Uh, if you just accept that they're the same thing, then you're missing out on all the fun. And, <laughs> of, and of you you asked wrestling with it. You asked a little bit ago about the this you know the use of the word yeah visceral. yeah yeah I like the word and yeah yeah. This I, is one of the places that, yeah. that 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 enters into this discussion yeah. is that when you have hit upon you know this sort of truth of connection of these two uh, forms of study and practice, there is this visceral embodied experience where, again, where there's this ability to not know for sure not, and to not be attached and to listen deeply and to feel the connection. Um, and that's all a visceral, intuitive sort of experience. And and you know, you don't want to only go into that realm. The mind needs to be part of it also. Mm. But our default for many of us is the mind, you know, someone with a strong mind saying, you know, okay, I mm. get it. I understand it. I know what to do. And so it's mm. the value of having a strong mind and having a strong view of things and ability to have a uh, discriminating awareness, but then mm. to set it down and feel sense into it uh is you know and it's a it's a it's a dance you go back and forth between those things mm -hmm. yeah one thing the buddhist schools are good at um is debate um you know where they'll just choose and shankaracharya was good at it too <laughs> but people are afraid of shankaracharya because he was he kind of because he would make up the opposition arguments, but you just go back and forth and saying that you are, you know, that's just a dialectic, a, a, a wave pattern within Prakriti, you know, the, the discussion. And that's just the nature. If you don't do that, you won't discover the context of each of the ideas you have mm. or of your own tradition. You won't see the various contexts. And so then you won't experience uh, the infinity. Um, and so you're not really, your yoga isn't any good. And so, and like you, you'll see in Tibetan schools where they teach kids, you know, debate, and then they get you and then they slap their yeah, hand. Slap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I suppose it is like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then, there, then, and, yeah. The way it, then everyone laughs, you yeah. know, as yeah. it would, just to see that, uh, that's the way that ideas work, and but most people are scared to death of that. You know how, you know how how dare you question? You know the prophet. You know you. you know. I, I think it's a really tricky thing, isn't it? Because you've got this idea of trying to kind of humility and kind of ex coming out of your own mind to embrace the other inner teaching or something that you you know like. You know, how can you ever learn or, or, or develop yourself in any way, whatever that means, unless you go out of yourself to the unknown, right? And on the other hand, you, you've got the importance of questioning, you know? Because if you just accept something whole scale and you've just kind of taken your, your conventional body of knowledge and just overlaid that with a whole other exotic, mystical, you know, body of knowledge, yeah. right? Which is just another yeah. knowing, which you're back to the square one, just in a more silly way, a more silly version exactly. of yourself than you were originally, right? Like, yeah, exactly. True. That's why the, the tradition is you're supposed to inquire or ask, you know, in the Gita, they say you, you, you find someone who's good at sacrifice, the art of sacrifice, and then you just like, you know, basically do pranipate and you go, that means... And then you ask questions, pari prashna, and you have to ask questions on every level, you know, inside, outside. You're just like looking, looking, you know, uh, perhaps in an irritating way, like a two-year-old uh, might ask why, and you tell them why, and they'll say well, why, and they're actually geniuses at that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this, you're supposed to do that. Um, but there's a, a a certain delight in that. That's what the the actual Vedantic tradition is, and that's the actual Buddhist tradition is to uh, just keep looking and looking uh, again and again. Um, and the Gita wants that. This is 
Arjuna, because Krishna never actually answers Arjuna in the Gita uh, as to what he should actually do. Uh, and he presents different schools, but he often presents them in ways that are very irritating. Um, <laughs> he does good presentations, but he, you know, and so he's always bringing Arjuna back to that moment of like, tell me, would you just tell me yeah, already? Yeah. And uh, he, Krishna never tells him. And then finally, he tells them about, you know, seeing the beloved in the hearts of all beings and doing everything for the beloved. And then he says, now do what you, you choose. He never tells him, you know, and he says, you stand up and fight ignorance. You know, that's, the, he says, the enemy is, you know, lust, anger, and greed. And that's the enemy. Stand up. And, but he never tells him what to do on the battlefield. Because... Mm, mm. Just doesn't. <laughs> and so they're using the ideas that ego is a divine function. Uh, and, you know, the so we use this divine function, which is our mind, which has, you know, ego as part of its function. And that's why you can like get it, but it's not you. Mm -hmm. If you identify with your ego, then you're in big trouble. Okay. <laughs> But if you can't get rid of it, because then you're getting rid of the whole principle of mind, space, and time, and creation, if you do that. And that's a slippery slope, you know, because you you need to do a good job of thinking. <laughs> I wanted to ask more about this, the role of the guru, um, but and that seems a good point to ask, but I probably am um, conscious of time, and I wanted to ask Mary, actually, um, about the role of diet, actually, I was a cook in London, um, and um, I would, you know, recognise more than anything if you want to get um, more literal, visceral progress in your physical practice, you need to be careful with what you eat. But it seems like so often times people shoot themselves in the foot, especially in England, where we don't really have a, a basis of a reasonable basis of diet or cultural even recipes, etc. That uh, the people don't eat very well. Um, and what is there any basic guidelines that you can give for people maybe also struggling with food? I, you know, this is another topic, isn't it? But, uh, you know, Ashtanga can easily encourage you down the rabbit hole of, well, I feel a bit lighter. I'm getting a bit thinner. I uh, practice is better. And, you know, it can ricochet you know, or at least spiral into a, you know, a very unhealthy place, you know? Exactly. And mm. it's, you know, that that's an, it's such an important question for mm. all yogis and especially ashtangis because it's like, well, never eat after such and such yeah. an hour, et cetera. Yeah. And um, my, you know, we could go on for hours about yeah. this. So just in a nutshell, um, it, you know, really, truly noticing what response your body has to the actual foods that you take in and also looking at the um, sort of storylines you make up about that um, mm -hmm. as to whether or not they're good or bad or have, you know, you know, they're kind of indifferent sort of storylines and, and then circling back around again and again to what is it that makes the body feel steady and stable and open to the idea of questioning and and looking deeply and what is it that gives me the fortitude to be uh really connected to my environment and to other people mm. and personally you know i my disposition has been since a child that i really haven't liked meat though my parents are english we always had our roast beef on, you know, certain days, et cetera. Um, and I never liked it, but I, that's what I was brought up with. Right. Yeah. And over the course of time for many, 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 many years now, I've been vegetarian. Although I trained, as you know, in France at mm. um, classical French cooking with where, you know, the idea of vegetarianism is just like, you know, are you out of your mind? Like religious, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Here's here's a cassoulet. That's that's only got you know 
a little bit of bitterness. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, you know, my approach to it has been to really, truly trust that for me, for whatever reason, and, and it's got ethical reasons, it's got physical reasons, that the vegetarian diet that has plenty of protein in it and that is fresh and is local and is vibrant, full of life, that that is what makes me feel good. And when I was pregnant with our son, um, I was a vegetarian at that time, but every single meal I ate, I thought, well, you know, they say you need to be eating meat. Do I feel like I want to eat meat here? And as it turned out, I didn't ever feel like that. I did feel like eating eggs, which I normally didn't eat. Um, and so I ate them. Mm. And and I think that we that I didn't have this guilt or this preconception around what it is I should be eating because I was really tuning in. And that's what I encourage people to do mm. rather than taking a formula mm. to pay deep, close attention, to have respect for your own body, mm. to have respect for the food that you are eating. And if you choose to eat meat, that you respect the life that has gone into that. Mm. Um, and, you know, like Native American Indians, uh, they have rituals they do, um, thanking the animals that they, you know, have have sacrificed their lives to feed them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's something that is extraordinarily personal, mm. but that it has to make you feel more clear headed, more mm. strong bodied, more kind. Um, so that's kind of the overview of it. And mm -hmm. I have lots of other thoughts on it at some point. Uh, maybe I'll say them out loud. <laughs> maybe we could do one just on that on on yeah. diet actually yeah. I, I would like that very much um because there's a lot you know there's a lot more to say about it as well yeah. especially in a more confusing time people aren't sure how to eat they don't yeah. know how to make right decisions about things um yeah. you know the fine they're getting into unhealthy patterns how to undo those you know yeah. um the whole yeah. organic issue yeah i yeah. know uh, i know, mm. I know. It's huge. It's mm -hmm. huge. I wrote a book many years ago called What Are You Hungry For? Women, Food, and Spirituality. And uh, that came out in 2000. And I have started addressing some of these issues. So um, I've thought about it for a long time. I haven't read that, but I shall do. Um, and the title is brilliant. I do remember the title. But <laughs> I haven't read it yet. Um, okay, well... You know, I don't want to take more of your time and I'm going to have to wrap it up. I want to ask, and I, I didn't ask this recently. People got upset. And I didn't ask a little uh, uh, round at the end. Um, what are your guilty pleasures? <laughs> a stupid question. I, I stopped asking it because I think David Swenson said, well, if you've got anything to be guilty for, I'm not guilty of pleasure or something like that. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we know what you mean by yeah. guilty pleasure. Um, I'm going to confess to. Okay. I, I, I do have a almost religious devotion to coffee, uh, although not too much of it. Right. But uh, particularly if you if it's frothy, you know, like a, <laughs> a a cappuccino or espresso or something, that this is a sacred uh, ritual. Um, that in and then you, you can even drink it, but you can. There are also uh, Vedic, Orthodox Vedic things where you take like well prepared and you can pour it like an offering. <laughs> all over your body and because it's bubbly and each if you look at bubbles bubbles are just reflecting other bubbles and it's kind of like uh makes you pause um anyway and it's part of the the tradition and different parts of india you know it's either the holy drink is either tea or coffee yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very important to know uh, <laughs> where you are I'll always remember Matty because Matty Esrati, she she gave she she got me onto this idea of a coffee maker and it has like a how do you call it like a spumato so it's got like a really high pressure so it makes a foam when when it comes out 
Right, yeah. right. Like a, like a stovetop one, but you get this really foamy coffee that kind of forces it up really strongly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a great Marty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, she, I'm sure she'll be happy to be remembered for, for a phone yes. call. <laughs> At least she's remembered every morning. <laughs> and, and Mary, what, 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 are, what are your yeah, indulgences? It's a pleasure. I think yeah. that um, having been, yeah, having been brought up Catholic, right. um, guilt is kind of everywhere and associating it with pleasure is guilt, guilt and, well guilt and pleasure <laughs> but, yeah. but um diet in my diet the two things that are interesting is you know i really love the taste of salt and um and i have very 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 low blood pressure and so you know <laughs> they go well together right. um no guilt there yeah. i also like uh sweet certain sweets. I don't, I'm not like a chocolate fiend. Um, and I, but I find that just a certain correct level of sweetness and certain things, like if I do have coffee, which I don't often, um, today, should. today I have some and, um, that <laughs> I, I don't like coffee just with foam. I like it with some sweetener in it. Right, um, right, right. which, you know, Richard gives me one of his raised eyebrows and rolls his eyes <laughs> yes. at that. But so he, he, he brings the guilt to me for that. <laughs> You're well, it's perfect. It's a perfect Catholic combination then. You've got the pleasure and the guilt all mingled in there. You know? <laughs> in tipping it out into the unknowing. <laughs> <laughs> the ambiguous experience of being. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, one last thing. Um, what 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 in, what inspires you both? What are your inspirations? A person, a place, a book, something that, yeah. Hmm. Well, currently, what inspires me? We we've been spending quite a bit of time in Thailand, and right. the spaciousness and the jungle. Um, we live in the jungle, mm. uh, but you can see that the ocean from from where our house is and right now we're in boulder uh which is not Mouth a jungle <laughs> and extraordinarily dry and cold yeah. and for me that the spaciousness that allows my mind to um just not feel contained um but feel inspired is just remarkable so for right now that's that's like on my computer my desktop mm. is just a picture of looking from our house out into the jungle and you can see the ocean in the distance so that's that's what keeps me going are you, are you going back <laughs> oh we hope so yeah. yeah um we just have to wait for the right circumstances yeah. hopefully within a, a, a few months okay because <laughs> we <laughs> like it then. yeah, yeah that, <laughs> well, that's yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see I was what, what inspires me oh um, um in addition to nature <laughs> infinity uh the stars uh microscopic macroscopic um um i uh oh i've been reading more closely, the um, Hatha Pradipika, uh, and I'm finding, and the Shiva Samhita, um, and I find in certain verses, you know, the very good insights that are, are, are given there, and uh, often overlooked in most translations. Um, and so, We've been working with this idea of Shambhavi Mudra, which is Sham, you know, Sham just means not only clarity, but peace and joy and light and all the good things is Sham. And Shambhavi Mudra is where you gaze at something, but uh, there's this sense of softness. And, you know, and it literally says there is no one looking at anything. Hmm. Okay, so they... That text uses the term shunyata and shunya all the time. Mm. It's it's a half Buddhist text. Mm. Mm. And then there's this sense of like, ah, oh, and that lets you see what you're seeing and then you hear what you're hearing. And then internal forms or antara laksha 
start to be used naturally. And so the idea of whatever your vision or pattern that you think Mulavanda is, you naturally use it, but you're using it artfully rather than holding on to it and trying to make it happen. And so this is this is a verse I just discovered uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, I was so happy. <laughs> that definitely is a, a, def- a characteristic um, um, representation of what I would imagine your inspiration would be, Richard. Um, no, <laughs> no doubts about that. Um, <laughs> surprised you. That sounds very, very representative of you, the Shunyata and the, uh, you yeah, know, yeah, wonderful. Um, yeah, I'm rambling now. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Um, and it's been lovely to take up your time in hopefully an enriching manner for all our. Oh, we, we enjoy it thoroughly. Yeah. I yeah. did, did enjoy it. And I hope everyone does yeah. as well. And, uh, you yeah, <laughs> know, let's, uh, let's do another one at some point, Mary, with the, uh, with the, with the diet as well. That would be wonderful. Yeah. It was great to connect with you. Thank you. Thank you for coming Thank on. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Bye.